United Parcel Service delivered more than 21 million packages per day in 2019 to more than 220 countries and territories, including the North Pole. The company's annual revenue is over $61 billion, employing just under half a million. The man who started UPS was somewhat shy, who treated his employees like partners. In this episode, we will discuss the man behind the largest global shipping company who started UPS with a loan of $100, James E. Casey, also known as Jim Carrey. Jim's parents got married in Chicago. On March 29, 1888, they had their first child, James Emmett Casey. Jim was nine when the family moved to Seattle, a city of only 65,000 people. Due to his father's sickness, Jim had to quit school at 11 and found work assisting a delivery driver at the Bon Marche department store for $2.50 a week. In the meanwhile, Jim also found night shift work at ADT. Clocking in a shift from 7 p.m. till 7 a.m., this is where he met Claude Ryan. In 1903, with the savings of $30, Jim met John Moritz. The two started a messengering service company making $50 a month delivering messages for the local telephone and telegraph office. The business was a success, but then sadly, John Moritz was shot and killed. Disheartened, Jim called the business quits. Jim was 19 now and got back in touch with an old friend, Claude Ryan. And they started the American Messenger Company on August 28, 1907. They borrowed $100 and started their service with two telephones, two bicycles, and six boys from an office in a basement. From the very beginning, they would tell their customers the truth about when they would pick up and drop off their message. Jim's motto was, never promise more than you can deliver, and always deliver what you promise. Their first employees ran errands and made deliveries on foot and bicycle. They started charging 65 cents per message, and the service was available 24-7 every week. But getting customers was not easy, as customers would call all the messenger companies and give their business to the first that arrived. Telephones were now getting popular, so Jim and Ryan decided to work with retail stores and deliver products at customers' doorstep. A clothing store hired American Messenger to deliver merchandise. With a new client, the company had 10 messengers at work and bought their first delivery truck. As they were delivering packages for stores, they changed the company's name to Merchant's Parcel Delivery. Jim was super ambitious and wanted to serve the giant retail departments. He would approach retailers and suggest them that they could save money by eliminating their large fleet of horse-drawn delivery vehicles. To make quick deliveries in 1913, American Messenger merged with McCabe's Motorcycle Delivery Company. With the merger, they had 25 messengers and 6 motorcycles, and soon added a Ford Model T. By 1915, the company was the largest delivery service in Seattle, with 4 cars, 5 motorcycles, and 30 messengers on foot. Merchant's parcel covered 1,600 miles a day and generated $2,200 a month in revenue. Gradually, Merchant's Parcel won over three of the four biggest stores in Seattle. In the coming years, delivering for big retail clients became the new norm for the company. The year was 1918, the end of World War I. Jim wanted to expand across America but needed cash. As the war was coming to an end, getting money out of a bank was not easy. Jim saying, determined men working together can do anything, kept pushing on. With the war ending, Merchant's Parcel Delivery creating a new business model and renamed the company. The company was now called UPS. In the following years, UPS started to buy delivery companies using stock. The combination of all purchase helped UPS deliver 2,000 packages a day just in Los Angeles area in 1922. By 1929, UPS delivered more than 11 million packages. In order to expand, Jim decided to offer delivery by air, using private airlines to carry long-distance packages. In the fall of 1929, Curtis Wright offered UPS $2 million cash and 600,000 shares of Curtis Wright. UPS stockholders became Curtis Wright stockholders. UPS, using the $2 million, moved their headquarters to New York. The deal with Curtis was not a bad deal, 
as Jim and his partners were paid generous annual salaries of $25,000 each and were guaranteed management control for five years. However, this was 1929, also known as the year of the Great Crash. Share prices on the New York Stock Exchange collapsed. The demand for fast air service dried up. To stay in business, UPS had to end their air service. The crash gave Jim a chance to buy his company back from Curtis Wright, and they did, by exchanging Curtis Wright stocks they had for UPS shares. This deal helped them share their stock without having to return the $2 million. The cash was used by UPS to improve their service in New York delivery market. Soon, UPS had 159 vehicles, serving 37 New York stores. By 1950s, cars were becoming popular. People would pick their package using their own car. UPS sales were going down, but UPS had a plan. They relaunched the service they dropped off in 1931, air mail service. This time UPS was using commercial airlines to carry packages. By the time Jim retired from UPS in 1962, the company had grown to operate in 31 U.S. states with annual revenue of $550 million and had 22,000 workers. However, Jim was still active in UPS management until his death in 1983. With the airmail operating, UPS was serving 48 states. Jim reportedly told his associates, but you know, we are only serving 5% of the world's population. He wanted UPS to go global, and so they did. In 1975, UPS started its first international operation by expanding into Canada. UPS was delivering packages internationally using commercial airlines. To keep up with innovation, in 1982, UPS introduced its next day air service, guaranteeing overnight delivery on certain packages. A guaranteed overnight delivery did bring them business, but because they were relying on commercial airlines, the company couldn't maintain a standard. Sadly, on June 6, 1983, Jim passed away. Jim was a disciplined businessman. He treated his employees with respect. One of the things that separated him from robber barons at the time was his acceptance of unions. He worked hard to treat all his employees right and saw the rise of the unions as an opportunity to work with them instead of fighting with them. He introduced the principle of equal treatment for everybody and always stood for fair wages and good working conditions. Perhaps the most important character of Jim was his decision to share his wealth. Unlike many businesses, Jim wanted UPS employees to benefit from company success. In 1927, Jim offered stock at $15 a share to 52 employees allowing them five years to pay it off. Until his death, UPS stocks were either owned by his family or employees. It was not until 1999, 16 years after Jim's death, when UPS went public. He helped set a foundation for children suffering from social and health outcomes, Annie E. Casey Foundation, named after his mother. Jim also founded the Casey Family Programs in 1966, to provide, improve, and ultimately eliminate the need for foster care. To effectively deliver packages overnight, UPS started the UPS Airline in 1988. Currently, they operate with a fleet of more than 200 aircrafts. Following Jim's teaching, UPS focuses intensely on efficiency. They provide their drivers with the best driving routes, advise drivers to avoid making a left turn, to hold keys on the right side for quick start, UPS once did a research where they found out that avoiding a left turn reduces their annual fuel by 100 million gallons. The benefits are not just environmental. It costs UPS approximately $14.5 million per year for every minute a driver stays idle in the truck. You may have noticed that their trucks do not have a side door. One benefit of not having a side door is that it keeps them cool in summer. But also, with 240,000 drivers making 120 stops a day, by not opening and closing a door every delivery, UPS saves 40,000 hours daily. Today, UPS serves more than 220 countries and territories, employs more than 434,000 people, 
thanks to the man who took a risk and started a company in a basement with a $100 loan. His legacy has touched all of us in some way. Until next time, have a good one.